Hello, everyone, and welcome to a very special episode of Living on Music. I'm Steve Houck. And behind me, you see um, a pretty incredible image from Monument Valley, which is a red sand desert region right on the Arizona-Utah border. And <clears throat> it's only fitting that this would be the picture behind me for the show that I'm doing for you right here. Um, with uh, one and only, the one and only, uh, incredible photographer, Frank Stefanko. Um, it's Monument Valley here, and he is has an incredible uh, legacy and collection of wonderful nature-oriented um, types of um, uh, photographs um, from all over the uh, region, Canadian Maritimes, the Desert Southwest, Florida Everglades, Southwest Florida, French Polynesia, Hawaii. Uh, part of his career in, in photography has been nature, and that's why Monument Valley is behind me. But monument also is a word, I think, that fits Frank Stefanko very, very well, given the fact that over the years, as he evolved in his own photography career and was finding his way, all, began to uh, work with um, Patty Smith, who he met at Glassboro State College in, in South Jersey. And through Patty, uh, began his relationship uh, around probably, I would say, yes, around his 30s um, with Bruce Springsteen and was given the incredible honor and, and task of photographing Bruce for the darkness on the edge of town record. Um, again, thanks to a suggestion from his buddy, Patty Smith, it began in a relationship that is going to this day. They've known each other for all those years since darkness. And not only did Frank do the darkness cover, but as many of you know, he also did the river. Um, he photographed uh, Bruce a uh, selection of photographs um, around the Nebraska album, that there was another uh, image used in, uh, in Nebraska without Bruce in it, but he got a treasure trove of photographs for archives and galleries um, <clears throat> of Bruce. And also um, an incredible um, honor was that he was had the privilege of having what he called his Corvette winter photograph with Bruce Springsteen leaning on it in his old neighborhood on the cover of Bruce Springsteen's uh, bio born to run. So the legacy that he has with Bruce Springsteen is monumental, and it's not just Springsteen. There are a number of wonderful um, <clears throat> journeys that he's taken in his career in photography and in his life. And um, I cannot tell you, I have known this man's name for years as a Springsteen fan, knowing who took pictures of covers of his of Bruce's uh, albums and, and pictures of him and things like that through the years. But to be able to sit here and talk to Frank about not only his relationship with Bruce and how that began to him and his head and um, how it evolved, but also just his career as a photographer and beginning when he was a, a young, a young boy um, uh, falling in love with photography at a young age. Anyway, let's get to it. Let's go down this road with this amazing guy. Ladies and gentlemen, please give a warm living on music welcome to Frank Stefanko. Frank Stefanko, it is an absolute thrill having you on Living on Music. Welcome. How are you doing, man? I'm doing great, Steve. Thanks for uh, inviting me along here. Well, you know, again, and I said this in the open, um, um, Monument Valley is behind me, which is one of your photographs um, of, of many nature-wise, but there is a monument a set kind of uh, part of you that we'll be talking about, and that's what's exciting, uh, too, is to talk about your career where it's gone from the beginning, the amazing rides you've had with Bruce, knowing Patty, doing other things like that, doing your nature stuff. But let's talk a little bit about now. You you, you just remember what's going on the last three years. How has the pandemic affected Frank Stefanko and his family? Well, the, my children and my grandchildren, many of them have 
you know, had a taste of the, the COVID virus, but right. it wasn't uh, serious. Everybody's, you know, vaccinated and uh, with all the boosters and such, but uh, it has, um, it has changed things uh, in so much as people are just kind of staying home a lot and uh, right. not, uh, you know, not getting out there as much as, as we did. I mean, I, I still get out, my wife and I still get out and do some, you know, get to some restaurants and get to, get down to Atlantic City and things like that, you know, so. Uh, nice. But, you know, but we, we haven't had any major uh, trips in the last few years. And then, of course, um, Hurricane Ian destroyed Sanibel Island, which is yes. one of the places that we love to go to every year. So did wow. we used to a base camp to get out into the Everglades and the swamps to do you know, do landscape and wildlife photography. Right. And so that is a, that was a really hard hit area. That really was. And um, was, did, yeah. you're going to, you're going to go back at some point or is it still going to take a while to get built back? You know, they're still hauling out debris from all the, uh, from all the damage, but they are starting to, some of the businesses have reopened and, uh, but there's still an awful lot. They're still clearing out the debris. They're still working on rebuilding. It's going to take a year and a half to two years before, you know, things are kind of back. I mean, I've seen um, film and, you know, of the uh, area, uh, some friends of mine have done, um, you know, uh, different shots down there and all the, all the greenery, you know, I mean, all these palm trees and beautiful greenery was just swept away with oh. the, with the storm surge and, uh, you know, it'll grow back. It's right. Florida. Things grow fast in Florida, but uh, well, some things grow fast in Florida. Right. But, right. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, great. We get down there eventually and just kind of uh, poke around. We have we have some friends uh, that live in uh, Rotonda and in uh, you know in uh, other places uh, up and down the seventy five there. So we'll, right, we'll get down there. Well, that's great, and that, and and yes, the nature, uh, the nature will grow back for you too to 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 photograph. Um, so eight grandchildren. Um, they got they got they seem to get through. What were their what are their ages from what to what? Uh, my goodness, let me see. I think from about eight or nine, maybe ten, up to fifteen. Cool. Oh wow, what ages of kids? That that must be just an absolute an absolute thrill right now, though, and and. And even getting through something like a pandemic when you have a wonderful family like that, that had to be great though, at least they got through fine. Everybody's fine. Yes. Thank you for asking. Uh, my, 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 my pleasure. I, I asked all the musicians too. And as you well know, being a, a you know, knowing music uh, over your entire life, how deeply uh, hard this was on everybody, including that guy, you know, we'll talk about it in a little while, Mr. Springsteen. I mean, everybody was hit so hard yet they've come back and a lot of people wrote music uh extensively during this period and now they're able to release all this stuff so it kind of gave some musicians a chance to chill you know you you can recognize that right and a chance to reform and, and grow and write their music it's a good opportunity i mean bruce uh bruce came out with uh, you know only the strong survive and uh and of course uh you know the one before that the, right uh, letter to you yeah letter oh you. you know he he didn't all all of my life knowing him from 1978 to present the man does not sit idle right. <laughs> he's got an incredible work ethic and uh I'm, and he used that time to to do a lot of writing and a lot of recording and yes uh and now he's ready to go out and well he's already done it so oh and you've, yeah and you've seen the clips all over the place mitch slater your buddy boy did he go wild the first night in tampa and he provided us largely i felt like i'd almost gone to the show with what he had provided us and you know bruce was getting his 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 self going back again but after the last couple of shows that's been amazing we're going to talk obviously a, a, a lot about him um i wanted to ask you your photography life right now did you have you done any photography over the last couple of years during this time did you go out and do anything or just to your own self local stuff going down and I live in Southern New Jersey near Philadelphia. And um, there's a big piece of real estate in New Jersey called the New Jersey Pinelands. Right. And um, it's one of the last big wilderness areas yeah. on the East coast, you know, right. uh, but uh, we like to 
drive down into the pine lands and get out and take some, you know, landscape pictures. And if we see some wildlife, take some wildlife just to keep active and keep out there. And, you know, yes. it's, you know, you get cabin fever, get in a car, got to go somewhere. Let's go. Um, what I love is that we get to talk about Frank Stefanko's photography growing and where it went over the years and boy, did it have some amazing moments, but you know, you started around eight years old, Frank, and that was with an old box camera given to you by your dad at eight. And what did you start feeling at that point that again has gone for the last seven, almost 70 years? I think I was, you know, even prior to discovering that old box camera in the dining room drawer, um, I've always been fascinated about, um, you know, uh, photo ops, photo things, uh, optical illusions, right. all that stuff. I, I remember getting uh, going to the penny candy store and getting um, bubblegum cards and there was some uh, cards in there, but you had to hold them up to the sun right. to make the image come out. I mean, I was fascinated by that. I was, you know, all that kind of thing. So. Wow. Uh, when I when I finally uh, saw the box camera and asked my dad if I could borrow it, and he said, no, no, you can have it. You know, I, I'm not using it. And he showed me how to load it up with roll film and I'd run out into the neighborhood and, you know, take pictures of anything that I, you know, well, that was the beginning. And, uh, you know, I went from this camera to that camera to this camera to now where I have all these, I have, you know, really sophisticated cameras uh, in the digital age. Uh, but uh, the good thing was that throughout my education, I, in high school and in college, I took a lot of art courses. So I learned about what makes a good piece of art, you know, uh, composition, uh, repetition of shape, rep you know, placement, yeah. all that stuff. The, the John Ford thing about don't make the horizon go right down the middle of the, the image. You know, make it high, make oh. it low. You know, almost sounds like an Eagles fight song. But anyway, <laughs> it does. And your father built you a, a, a dark room uh, for you. Uh, that that is an added bonus beyond belief, I think, for a lot of people who are beginning this photography love. Is that you? Had, that's was that an amazing thing? Well, I was blessed with the fact that uh, my parents. Uh, I don't want to say they they you know indulged us, but they supported my brother and I in whatever we wanted to do. They were very supportive. And, and my father was a carpenter. Actually, he was a cabinet maker. And um, when I, you know, approached him about maybe getting a darkroom set up and I was just gonna, you know, mock up one, but he said, no, I'll build you one. And uh, what does it need? And he even went so far as to uh, put louvers uh, in this boxes, one high and one low that let the fresh air filter through the dark room with all the chemicals and everything and yet would not allow any light in so that was i was <laughs> impressed <you know>? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he built me that in our first home uh, in our you know family home he built me a dark room in the basement and then years later when uh when i when i got married to my first wife who right uh, has long gone passed away right uh, so um but we had an apartment and I, we had a gigantic walk-in closet and I turned that into a dark room. And then when we finally moved into our first home, my wife and my two kids and I, um, he came over and converted part of my, a big chunk of our basement into a big working dark room. Oh. So well, I, I can't thank him enough for that. No, and see, Frank, there you go. I mean, you're be you, you, you began that love of, of photography, but it was perpetuated by a wonderful role. I love the fact that you were photo editor of the high school yearbook, which again, is a wonderful way to represent. What was, what was the best part of doing that at that point? The high school yearbook thing? Yeah. Just being, I had access to everything. You know, nice. Yearbook coming in for photographs, you know, there's a certain, I did some uh, stringer work for uh, uh, my brother-in-law at the time worked for uh, the New York times. Oh, uh, I got to do some stringer work uh, when there was a story in South Jersey. He would call me to go cover it, you know. So really, it was it was the, the access, uh, the fact that yeah, you, you were able to get into places that most people couldn't. It was kind of fun, you know. Oh, but, totally. The, the New York Times was the legend of my life growing up in Wilton, Connecticut, right outside of the of New York City. Um, 
The New York Times was a, a Bible for my family. So I love that, that that in Jersey, you were asked to go down and take pictures for the, for the New York Times. During this whole time, Frank, as your photography life was, was burgeoning, um, you were listening to music and it was rock. It was folk. It was soul. Was there anything that was coming into your, I mean, it seems like rock and roll was the, was the, the number one thing. Yeah, Steve, it was, you know, just like anybody my age, I guess, and uh, I'm, I'm kind of ancient, <laughs> but, uh, you know, grew up uh, listening in the 50s to, to Elvis Presley and, uh, you know, and then everybody that, that came along with the, with the uh, rockabilly uh, age with the, you know, uh, Carl Perkins and, mm. uh, you know, and Johnny Cash, all this kind of stuff. And then uh, also L Little Richard and, um, you know, all the other Chuck Berry. I mean, you know, you can name them. Uh, that was exciting music. You, you could dance to it. it. It was alive. And as the music uh, kind of evolved, uh, I kind of evolved with the music that I like. So right. the rock and roll, I went to rock, you know, the Rolling Stones over the Beatles. Uh, you know, right. Uh, so, uh, right. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, even uh, Janet Hamill, who's a poet and friend of Patti Smith, on the back of my Patti Smith book, wrote, uh, they were two uh, unique people. They liked the Stones better than the, the Beatles, you know. <laughs> right. But, uh, but uh, you know, it, you go on and uh, the Stones and, the, and all the bands that came out, you listen to Led Zeppelin, you listen to them all, you know, Eric Clapton, Vanilla Fudge, I don't know, everybody that came along. And then, you know, the hippy dippy days came and you were into yeah. folk music, Tom Rush and uh, Pax yes. and Joan Baez and Bob, well, Bob Dylan was, was God then, you know. And, yes. Uh, but, it, but somehow throughout all that, there was a, a threat. There's something about it, the music was exciting. It was informative that, you know, but then it stopped and this bubblegum music came in, you know, right. uh, yummy, yummy, yummy. I got love in my tummy, you know, stuff right. like, and then, and then all of a sudden I heard a live radio broadcast by my old friend, Ed Shockey in Philadelphia at the main point. And there was a band called Bruce Springsteen and the E Street Band. And then that was it. It all came back and the, the excitement was there. And he encompassed the music, Motown, uh, soul, uh, blues, rock, oh. rockabilly. It was all in there, you know. Totally. It was all in there. Yeah, I, I love that. And then, and then and that's when you ended up hooking up with them a little later than that. You, you went to Glassboro State College. Um, and you met Patty Smith. And was, was she a musician yet or was she still mo mostly a poet and a writer and things? She was a poet, uh, a, a sculptress. She yes. was doing sculpt sculpting there. That's right. Um, everywhere on campus she went, she had a sketchbook with her and she was drawing images everywhere. And she was reading. Um, uh, Baudelaire and she was reading Rambeau and she was reading you know all the just <laughs> people that most people in that bucolic school never heard of she was so wow worldly, even though she at the time and but soon after uh, never left the United States you know right then she Paris and uh, that was a, a whole other thing oh that then you guys just met as as friends and and then um, you took her yeah, to uh, friends. What happened is I was sitting, there was a place on campus called the co-op and it would, you could buy a hamburger or a hot dog and get a soda. They had a jukebox there that had Dylan and the stones, which that was fine by me. Sure. And I was sitting in a booth looking at my biology book and there was some uh, bohemian types sitting next to me and uh, they were friends of Patty's and the door opened from the co-op and almost like a, uh, you know, the, I said in the vacuum, you know, <laughs> with a floor length white leather coat and black hair all the way down her back that just kind of flowed and inky like. And she walked in and moseyed, I used the word moseyed up to Janet Hamill, who was sitting with the group and said, 
Janet, fire of my loins. How the hell are you? you know? <laughs> fire and, uh, of my loins. I said, I need to know this person. Her. I need to be friends with this person. Right. And you this were fr you, you were friends well enough, Frank, where you took her to her first Rolling Stones concert in Philadelphia. Where was that in Philly? Philadelphia Convention Hall. I think it was either 1965 or 1966 oh. when they first came to Philly. Wow. And it was, it was a, a situation where they had folding chairs, you know, and we were like four or five rows back and everybody was standing up on these flimsy metal folding chairs to see better. And I, I say, I tell this story about Patty said, where do you see this? And she jumped off the chair, ran up to the front of the stage and placed herself right in front of Bill Wyman, the bass player, who was known as stone face Bill Wyman. He never yes. cracked a smile. And she folded her arms and stared him down. And he looked at her and cracked a smile. And she turned around and went, yes. <laughs> <laughs> that is great, getting a smile out of Wyman. That is a, a huge feat of, of hers. You guys, as, as you were doing that, Frank, and, and at Glassboro, where was the photography part of you going? Uh, still hadn't really emerged. Uh, I hadn't even taken photographs of her at this point. While yes. We campus it was shortly after that um she went to new york she okay. wanted always to go to new york and she left school and went to new york and i left shortly after and i would go up to new york city because some of my high school friends were up there uh, uh my friend ken tisa who was a great artist um and still lives in men in soho right uh, time was living in uh, in brooklyn they were going to uh pratt which is a great art school. Sure is. And, um, yeah, it was uh, Ken Tisa, Robert Maplethorpe, oh. and Howie Michaels, and a bunch of other folks up there. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I think that's when Patty finally came up and was looking for Ken and found Robert. Robert. And, yeah, uh, and they bonded. They, yep, they bonded. So I would go up to Manhattan. Then they you know, eventually all moved into lower Manhattan, into Soho and the village. So I would go up sometimes on weekends. Now I was married, I was working, right. yes. you know, and I had two children. So once, maybe once every a month, I would go up on the weekend and visit my friends and I would take photographs of, you know, if we went to a club, the, you know, I, I, the ocean club, I took pictures of Patty. Well, uh, also was uh, Lou Reed and John Cale on stage oh. like that. Um, so taking pictures on the streets, taking pictures in clubs, but mostly taking pictures of Patty because she was my muse at the time. You know, I really liked her, her look and, uh, and she needed photographs because she was starting to evolve. Wow. And so I was able to photograph her uh, from the sixties through the seventies and a little bit beyond that uh, at the time in New York. And you did, you did um, cause we've exchanged some things going into the show. You've, you've, done other photographs of other other rock stars um, as well. Was that around that time or over the next number of years? At the same time, I started going to rock concerts in Philadelphia at the, the legendary Spectrum. Yes. In Philly. And uh, my, yeah, I was able to, and the Spectrum and the Tower Theater. Yeah. Uh, for Darby. So I was able to photograph, you know, uh, Bowie and, uh, and uh, Led Zeppelin and... Uh, oh. Oh, and I went to the um, prior to Woodstock, there was a big concert in Atlantic City called the Atlantic City Pop Festival. Oh. And I went to that uh, at the at the racetrack outside of Atlantic City and um, photographed Janis Joplin oh. and uh, uh, Frank Zappa and the Mothers of Invention. And uh, I just I can't even remember everybody else that. Uh, Joe Cocker was there, and and where uh, did those pictures go, Frank? Did you did you put them out anywhere or keep them to yourselves? Some some rock magazines would grab some, but mostly they just stayed in my archive. And yeah, right now I still I still own my archives, and um, but I may be doing something with uh, my Ooh. my entire archive very shortly, but I don't want to say anything about that yet. No exclusive here yet. Maybe you can give it to me when you do it and we can, we can do it exclusively. Well, that, that, no, that's, ex that's exciting to know that you might be doing that. You, you were working as a truck driver, um, yep. uh, supporting your family. And then there was a suggestion from Patty to this guy that you knew very, 
well of Bruce Springsteen. Had you you hadn't met him yet, and well, how did you've said this I, before? But I I want to hear it from your face. I had not met him, but ever since that first concert that from uh, Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, at the main point, main point. Cafe, um, which I had gone to many times previously to see, you know, Spider John Kerner and uh, oh. just all kinds of you know folk guys there sure <laughs> excuse me sure <laughs> that's that was a great thing about philly there were these folk clubs yeah. the second fret the main point the gilded cage uh everybody came to these venues uh, so i got to see Joni mitchell buffy saint marie uh oh. rush uh, tom paxton eric anderson you know just all the it was great wasn't photographing in those days wish i had that would have been a great a great amount of uh, folk uh, photographs. Sure. But anyway, getting back to uh, Bruce, I he heard that first concert at the main point and I was blown away. It was like I was, all of a sudden music became alive again for me. Oh. This four, four, she's gonna overheat. Make up your mind, girl, I gotta get her back out on the street. I know you're lonely like me, so baby, don't try and fake it. I'm no prince and I can't lay the stars at your feet, but I got this old car and she's pretty tough to beat. There's plenty of room in my front seat, baby, if you want to take And so I went out and bought Greetings from Asbury Park and The Wild, The Innocent, and The E Street Shuffle. And that was all great. And then my dear friend Eric Miola did the cover for an album called Born to Run. Yeah. And that was it. I mean, there, all of a sudden it all came together. It's like, these, this is incredible. Right. And that was prior to darkness and prior to his litigation problems and yes. with former manager and la, la, la. And that, um, that was kind of when he got all that resolved and he had some people take photographs for darkness on the edge of town but I think he didn't feel that whatever the photo, he told me the photographs were too slick that the other people, I won't mention them, took pictures of. And uh, he liked the photographs I did when we got together. And he felt that uh, these images reflected the characters that he was writing about in darkness. And he also used one of my shots for the cover of the river two years right, later. Right. Because it was the same characters. It was the same, the same feel. When, exactly. when you when you went to meet him at that house, and again, you've talked about this before, a lot of the people that will be watching are devoted fans of yours and of Bruce's and know this a little bit, but talk a little bit about arriving at that house. What house was that that you took those pictures of Bruce in for darkness? And what what was it like meeting this guy? And what was he like around you at that moment? That's, okay. Well, first of all, the house was my house. That's what I thought. Field, New Jersey. Wow. And we had a couple conversations before he came down on the phone. And uh, I said, do you want me to come to New Jersey or, you know, North Jersey? Do you want me to come to New York City? Uh, or do you want to come down here? He said, no, I'll come down to your place. You oh, know? God. And, uh, what should I bring? And I said, well, bring some changes of clothes. Bring right. a wardrobe. And, of course, he had like a T-shirt, a pair of jeans, a couple shirts stuffed into a supermarket paper bag. That oh. was his wardrobe. So nice. he ended up it up giving him some of my clothes to wear for some oh. shoot sessions including this uh, crazy paisley shirt this blue paisley shirt that he wore that was my shirt but i got it because it reminded me of the dylan cover of oh. highway 61 i think it was and right. so you know he wore that and he wore some of my other shirts in some of the shooting sessions oh wow how so, fun yeah he came down to my house knocked on the door my wife and kids were there um came in, sat into my living room with the paper bag full of clothes. We sat on my, you know, on the sofa. I brought out some portfolios of work that I had done in New York and, you know, whatever. Uh, just this was my style. And um, and he said, I like it. I like it. You know, so then we started talking and we found that I found out that we had a lot in common. We were uh, we were both uh, we both had Italian mothers and non-Italian fathers, you know, oh. Right. And, uh, we, you know, we're New Jerseyans. We were working class families. We love the Jersey Shore. We love the same music. So we 
got real familiar with each other right away and it was comfortable. So when we started working that same day right. and shooting in my house in different parts, I had moved into the house uh, not too long before that. So we didn't have a lot of furniture left in, you know, brought in yet. And we hadn't finished it all. So there were a lot of nooks and crannies and places where, you know, I could set them up for different, uh, you know, shoots. So we worked there that day. We listened to music and we did a lot of shooting. And when we were done that evening, he drove back up to Home Dell, where he was staying at the right. time. And uh, he said, can I come back? Before he left, he said, can I come back tomorrow? And I said, sure. So we did some more shooting. Uh -huh. And then after that, he said, can I come back next week with the East Street Band? And they came down to my house. I had the whole East Street Band in my house. They were, they were shooting craps on my dining room table in between shooting sessions, you know, just to pass the time. We took a drive out to a friend of mine had a luncheonette in East Camden and did some work there. We just, um, we just, you know, and then I heard, he called me later and he's a couple of a week or two later. And he said, can you come up to New York and do some shots up on the roof of the record plant? I said, sure. And I went up to New York and we did that whole set. I, I, I shot hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of images of him over that period of time. I had the, I had the pleasure of having uh, time where a oh, lot but of guys don't have that time with them these days. And and Frank, that was the time where Bruce was able to get through the Mike Appel issues after Born to Run. It's when I fell in love with him in 1978 when my my roommate who lived in Ridgewood, New Jersey, brought freshman year brought darkness which is beautiful, amazing to even think of there, there's your photograph. He brought darkness into our dorm room and put it on. And I, I was a Southern rock fan, a Zeppelin fan, a Connecticut guy. And I fell in love with him from that moment on. And it's just an incredible thought that you were doing this at the time when he was really turning a corner. And then from then on, it has been the rising literally and his, his own self. You also did Southside Johnny's Hearts of Stone. Was that around that time? It was the same time, 1978. Uh, I, Bruce had given me a bunch of tickets uh, to his show at the Spectrum, to oh. several shows at the Spectrum, and I took a lot of my friends with me, uh, so that was a wonderful thing, but um, yeah, I was backstage uh, waiting to see Bruce in his dressing room, and Stephen uh, Van Zandt came up to me and he said, hey Frank, um, what are you doing Sunday? You know? <laughs> what are you doing and, Sunday? And I knew that that was an invitation, and I said, you tell me, Steve, what am I doing Sunday? And he said, oh. to Little Italy, I want to shoot the South and the, and the whole band. Oh, ten, it was a 10 piece band at the time. Right. And um, Obadiah Dietzik was alive and uh, she was assisting. I mean, it was a party. You know, I went up with a couple of my, my buds that assisted me and we took all these shots. We started at 11 o'clock in the morning in Little Italy at Mulberry and Hester Street at, um, uh, you know, where Joey Gallo got shot at the right. clam bar, you know, which they wanted in the pictures. And then we did some shots at other, and wherever we sat down, the whole 10 piece band would sit down and order something. So we didn't just occupy seats and they ate and paid, they paid, you know, Obi had a little pouch around her neck loaded with cash. So whatever oh. we needed to pay somebody off, it was, yeah, here you go. <laughs> That's was, phenomenal. Oh yes. my God. And and John 11 in the morning till 11 at night. And then the band left and Southside Johnny and Stephen Van Zandt and my friend, my partner, Billy, my assistant and myself went to Puglia's restaurant sitting across from um, Paul Servino, oh. was one of the tables. And we had veal, best veal in town. We had oh. veal, we had wine. We talked rock and roll history. And I'll tell you this, and I've mentioned it before, nobody knows rock and roll history like Stephen and Southside. I mean, Johnny and Stephen, except for Bruce. The, if the three of them were together, they'd be an encyclopedia of rock and roll. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. It was a wonderful time. And, uh, and I drove all the way back home that night to, to South Jersey with a big smile on my face. Oh, my God, Frank. What a what a marvelous story. I've... I've Southside Johnny, I've interviewed um, and obviously loved him since back in my high school days and, and got to meet him finally at the Birchmere. The two shows that I've gone to in Philly, the only two were Bruce at the Spectrum in 1999 and also him as his solo 
acoustic thing he did at at the uh, in Upper Darby at the Tower, and so that is my own part of my own Bruce World. But wow, what a wonderful, wonderful time! Uh, apparently, yeah, it was, it was per, apparently Bruce liked you because a couple of years later you did the river. Now, how did that how did that come into bear? Did he say, "Hey, Frank, come on over and do it," or where did that develop? California mixing the album right with New Octel. And um, uh, he called me on the phone at night. And um, after he was done everything he had to do, it was like, I don't know, two o'clock in the morning, give me a call, you know, Eastern time. And he said, uh, when we did the first shooting sessions, I had given him a whole pile of contact sheets of all the shots that we did right. for um, darkness. And he had this whole pile of stuff. Right. And, and it, he said, uh, Frank, go to uh, uh, sheet number 23, uh, image number four. Uh, can you make the right side of that a little darker? And he, uh, so then I'd go into an all night dark room session. Oh. I'd up what he wanted. I'd FedEx it to California. They would put everything out and they're on the floor and they're looking at everything. Then I get a call a couple nights later. Uh, sheet number. This went on for about two weeks. <laughs> And I'm doing, I'm doing like epic darkroom sessions, printing oh. up stuff, you know, and sending it to him. And then finally, he called me up and he said, uh, from the 1978 shooting of uh, Darkness, they pulled the the, the plaid shirt, and he he said, uh, and also I shot that back picture of it was a, a paper goods store where there was right. The, the bride and the groom and the American flag and all these representatives uh, of of the things that he was singing about in the album. And so they used that on the back cover. Oh. And, um, you know, uh, so that was that was wonderful. <laughs> oh, that is that is incredible that he would he would go back to that series of photographs and find yes, something that he'd want to do. He was a, that on that tour. He was at Madison Square Garden in Manhattan. And uh, he gave me a, about six tickets for that concert. And I took all my New York friends. Oh, great. Because, you know, we just got in the cab and, you know, went over to the garden and I looked because there was a wall on a, you know, a street near the garden. And my album cover shot uh, for the river was plastered all over the oh. world. A hundred of them, you know, and, and my friend Zamba said, look you know he said holy shit <laughs> oh my god that what a what a bonus to yeah. come there and see those all over the place i had saw him in 79 my first time ever at no nukes last row on the top at the garden and i was mesmerized and he only played about an hour and a half because it was at the no nukes with everybody else yeah, first the yeah the fir first show uh full show was 1980 the river at in hartford connecticut third row in front of clarence still of thousands of shows I've gone to in my life of all different artists, it's the best show I've ever seen. So it, it still lives for me when you were growing with him. Two years later, Nebraska, okay? So and then Nebraska is a different world for him, recorded in a hotel, right, with an eight track or, a, you know, he, he just did it very, very minimally. It ended up one of the most wonderful pieces of, of music he's ever done. How did you work with him? I know you took a number of photographs and then they they used, he used a, a regular... Yeah, uh, he David Michael Kennedy yeah. for the cover. David, right. David's out west. He does a lot of um, um, photographs that are using an old process that's platinum, platinum printing, and it, they're just beautiful. I'm, you know, I met him. Um, but anyway, getting off the point, right? We talked about this, you know, Nebraska, and he said, let's. His, his invitation, I, no, that was, the, that was the next one after that. But anyway, so let's get together. So he came to uh, Haddonfield, to my house in 1982. And we did shots around the neighborhood in my house. There was a little park in the neighborhood. We took a, you know, with a, with a lake, little pond or a lake. We walked around there and did some shots. Uh, <clears throat> and then one of my, my wife at the time, uh, my first wife, right. mother of my child, uh, had a friend that uh, heard that Bruce was coming over. So she came over with her husband and they started, you know, Bruce had his 1960 uh, uh, Corvette and this yes. guy had a 19, you know, modern, newer Corvette. And he said, well, well, I got this Corvette. All of a sudden I said, there's something real wrong about all this. And uh, 
hey, Bruce, let's take a ride, you know, and we both got in my car. And it was funny because uh, uh, I said, do you have any cassettes? I said, because all the cassettes I have in my car right now are yours. <laughs> <laughs> we had a Credence Clearwater Revival best of out of his car. Oh. And we went streaming off into the Jersey Pinelands and just, you know, just getting away. And uh, I remember oh. things we're driving through a town called Hamilton, New Jersey. Right. Which Right in the middle of the state is a great farming community, right. and um, and there was some signs that that it were uh, humorous, you know. And he he's going, oh look at that, and, and I could tell he was storing all this stuff in here for oh future God. use, you know. Then we right. got out of the weeds and we took some pictures, and um, and then we came back, and and then finally he asked me uh, to come up to where he was staying which was in uh, Monmouth County. He had rented a carriage house okay. right on the Abbasink River. Mm -hmm. So that's where we did most of the really, you know, the cool shots with the, with the uh, Gibson guitar that, uh, you know, and uh, all these other things. So uh, uh. We, once again, hundreds and hundreds of images from all these um, shooting sessions for uh, Nebraska. Oh, and where did the, uh, Frank, where did the, the Corvette winter photograph, was that from that time, from that shoot? Or? Original uh, darkness shoot uh, in Haddonfield, New Jersey, right out in front of my house. We, we had decided to, it was freezing cold. It was February. It was freezing cold. And I said, well, let's go out and do some, you know, some location shots out on the streets. And, all. and he was good with it. He had a thin leather, black leather jacket and, a, and his that flannel shirt. Right. And he did. I'm I'm bundled up in a freezer jacket, you know, <laughs> as we were coming off the porch of my house, his car was there. And I said, why don't you just go lean up against the hood of the car for one shot before we move on? And we did one shot darkness, the Corvette winter shot, 1978 in front of my house, singular shot. I didn't do a series. We let we left that shot and then we went off into the street and did some other things. Oh, and in 2016, I believe it was. He did, which is still in my brain, the bio, the bi autobiography, Born to Run. The picture's on the front. How did that feel? <laughs> it was a double uh, double thing because not only did he use my photograph for the front and back cover as it wrapped around the cover, he also gave me about two or three paragraphs inside the book. Yes, which, yeah, he sure did. Which really was wonderful. And yes. Uh, and I was, and I got to go to the uh, book party in New York. Right. Uh, and was my wife and I were both amazed. Besides the people from, uh, um, you know, from the publishing company, um, uh, and 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 Bruce's people, you know, right. Landau and such. Right. Uh, it, I were you know milling around, and uh, you know there were books all over the place in this restaurant, and. Who walks in? Tom Hanks walks in with his oh, wife. Nice. And, and Steven Spielberg walks in with his wife. And and uh, Ralph Lauren walks in. Oh. And, uh, just all these, you know. Oh, excuse me. Mr. Robert De Niro walks in. Oh, wow. Oh, my God. That seems to fit perfectly with the, <laughs> with the oh, Bruce group. I cannot believe this. This is like, you know. We're not a, you know, we're not an A-list type of people, you know. So uh, anyway, we, uh, it, that was a wonderful thing. That uh, is, that is. Yeah. Those things are. I, I remember I, I, I went to the Bill Graham autobiography book party in New York City when that came out, and he had died, and it, you know, it was an amazing experience, and I got to meet Ron Wood, Chuck Lavelle, Michael Lang, all these amazing people just come in and float into the worlds of the people that do the books. Exactly. But look, that book. I don't know. There's something about it. And I'm, I'm a huge book uh, music bio fan. I've interviewed a number of people who've written them too. And that book just takes, didn't, didn't you agree that it really took you to a place that he let you into? He really was, opened up for us. It was real. It yeah. was down to earth. It, he didn't, he didn't um, try to cover up anything. It was, he didn't try to present himself as anything other than who he was and what he had to you know, uh, from his early family life right through, you know, everything. Uh, I I read it several times, and then one time my wife and I were driving down to Florida, and I played his um, narration of the the book on the oh. audio. 
So oh. that, we played that. I think there were six six CDs, and we played it going down, and we played it coming back, and it was just so wonderful. Um, so yeah, that was uh, Born to Run was a great book. Yeah, what a thrill! I I I, I am so thrilled that you uh, that you were a part of that as well. Uh, a couple of years or so after the Nebraska photographs and, and you were moving along, you lost your wife and you were about 39 years old yeah. and that hit you very hard, right? Yeah. I mean, she was, she was a, a trooper. She had contracted uh, breast cancer six years prior and she, six years, she suffered with it, you know, chemotherapy, all everything that, you know, cancer, people will have to deal with and you know god bless the ones that uh survive and god bless the ones that that pass on but uh yes. she was a i just i never i i kind of fell in love with her all over again because she was uh -huh. so brave and uh you know all she cared about was taking care of the kids making sure the children were going to be okay you know uh it's it was a sad time uh yeah. So I bet it was Frank. And I'm, I'm where, what was your, what was your world for over the next number of years? Were you continuing the photography? I know a little while longer, you, you, again, you did your first museum show. We were going to talk about that in a second, the Troubadour of the highway show with Bruce, but what, what were you doing in those years after you lost her to keep yourself sane and involved and fulfilled work? I worked, uh, I had to earn a living. I was, um, I would come home. We had, uh, I had enough money that I could, I, well, I know what happened. My, my wife's mother was very sick. So I took her into my house wow. and um, so we needed somebody to help out. So we hired, there was a beautiful Jamaican lady named Dell who was just like a blessing to our family. And wow. uh, she stayed for a few years and, until uh, Esther passed away. And, uh, right. and, uh, but I would do a lot of cooking uh, for the kids and myself and, you know, we'd take them out. Uh, just, um, it was a tough time. My oldest son, uh, you know, he kind of braved it up, but I knew that he was hurt more than my younger son because he, you know, he had more memories with my first wife than uh, the younger ones. But it, you know, they're grown men now. They have families of their own, but that still lingers. I mean, you can always see that little something in their eyes. Uh, something like that just doesn't go away. You know? No, no, I bet it doesn't. Did you continue? So, did you continue to I, go out and photograph? Go out and do landscape pictures uh, wherever I could. Uh, just you know, just get out there and be out someplace peaceful. You know. Yes. And. Um, then it was shortly, I think it was 2004, when Bruce called me up to work on the um, Devils and Dust album. Oh. And he said, come on up to Colt Snack, come on up to the, the farm. He says, come on up, we'll, we'll just, we'll take some pictures and we'll have some fun. Oh, he, man. Pass up a, <laughs> an invitation like that. You know? Oh, that is spectacular. Was that the first time you'd been in touch in a little bit, in a little while? Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, what a... He was out in California for a while and, uh, you know. But yeah, that, was, it, that just shows it, Frank. I mean, you know, you hadn't been in touch for a while, but there was still that bond that you talked about a little earlier, that something clicked between you two. What was that day like? You took pictures, you hung out. Yeah, we did, went up to his, one of the older houses on his property before he built his, his home on the other side of the, the street because he owned both sides. Right. <clears throat> and uh, and then he built a studio there too, but uh, this was before that. It was an old farmhouse, and uh, there was uh, wallpaper was being stripped, and I guess they were working on it. But uh, I I had I did not get that. I mean, this was uh, at the same time that Danny Clinch was uh, doing a lot of work with Bruce. Danny, right. Danny is a dear friend of mine, as is Eric Miola. Oh, great. And. Uh, uh, Danny and I did a, a two-man show in uh, New York and in Sweden too. So that was, but anyway, uh, yeah, Danny shot that too, and he he ultimately got that album. Um, but um, you know, it was still uh, nice to be up there, and and I got an. So I didn't think too much of those pictures, um, 
and I put the contact sheets away. And as a, when I was working on my book, uh, the second Bruce Springsteen book called Bruce Springsteen Further Up the Road, I sure. pulled all that stuff out from 2004. And I said, damn it, this is good stuff. You know, <laughs> how did I not think it was way back then? You know, right. What was the first what was the first book again? First book was called Days of Hope and Dreams. Exactly. Right. Yeah. And what year was that? Uh ooh, ah, let me see. Ish. 2003 maybe, something like that. So that was around the time of the first with the Troubadour of the Highway show that you did, where tra or participated in that. What was that all about? Because I know that was a traveling show that premiered in Minneapolis and Yeah. Uh, well, uh, I, I was, remember that. Okay. There was a, I was um, living with my brother at the time. My kids were already getting older and moved into their own places. And I was living with my brother in Philadelphia, well, just outside of Philadelphia in Germantown. Right. I got a call from a person named um, Colleen Sheehy. Right. Who was the curator of the show for um, the Frederick Wiseman Museum. Uh, which was part of the University of Minnesota uh, in Minneapolis. And she came down to where I was living at the time, going through my portfolio. And she said, we're doing a, a Bruce Springsteen uh, museum show called Bruce Springsteen uh, Troubadour of the Highway. And I want your pictures in there. So that was it. I mean, uh, Pammy, uh, who's also a friend of mine, Pam Springsteen, had like 40 of her pictures in there from the out west from the desert shots you know from the ghost of tom joad shoots and, right right and, you know annie Leibovitz had a few shots and you know everybody had a few shots <clears throat> and i had a pretty good representation and that show went from that museum to the cranbrook in i think in chicago or someplace or detroit i think it was detroit right and it went California to so it was a traveling museum show. Yeah, and there was about that time that there was a there was that uh, there was that exhibit at the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame in Cleveland that I went and saw, which was I'm sure had had your work in it as well, um, and it was spectacular. In fact, it had the shirt, the uh, the, the shirt from the River Cover in in, in there. I was I love that. That um, yeah, I, I actually have a photograph of uh, holding that shirt here. Oh. The guy that bought the shirt. Uh, before I guess before he donated, he brought it down. He wanted to do oh, a thing of it. That's great. That same year, Frank, that uh, you did that, that uh, participated in that. You, you had your first one man gallery show uh, at Govinda Gallery in DC. Yay! Right, right, right here, curated by Chris Murray. That had right. to that, that had to be a pretty you know instrumental moment for you in your photography life. It was a wake up call to the point that you know we did the museum thing, and that was you know. A, with the, a lot of other people and all. But because of that, I decided that, you know, I have all these photographs of Bruce, of Patti Smith, of, you know, other things. I said, you know, all this rock and roll uh, genre. And uh, I said, well, maybe I could do something. I, you know, earn some extra money. So I brought my, I called Chris Murray. I heard about him uh, and I called him up and you know, he could have said, well, we're busy, you know, you know, come down some other time or, you know, I'll get back to you. No, he said, bring your stuff down. I'm dying to see it, you know. So my wife and I drove my current wife. Right. I, who was my high school sweetheart. Yes. Way, yes. Um, we drove down. It was like right around 2001 or so. I don't know. Right. Uh, and we drove down, brought my portfolios down and he sat there and he started going through page, you know, photograph by photograph by photograph. And um, he said, uh, I see a book and I see a show. And this is great. I haven't seen anything like this. This is wonderful, you know. Yeah. So we did the first show in, um, in Georgetown, in DC, oh. yeah. uh, where he had a his own gallery at the time, the Go right. Gallery. Yes. And, um, I remember I had taken, I don't know, 40 or so or 50 photographs and I framed them myself. And I, cause you know, I didn't know that you could work these deals out with galleries, you know, but <laughs> I framed them myself and I loaded them up and drove them down and he started lining them all up on, on the walls, you know, on the floor, leaning against the walls before they hung the show. And uh, so I went home and 
He called me up a few days later. He said, Frank, we've sold about 15 of these things before we even hung them on the wall. Oh, my God. We were selling over 40 or 50 pieces, and it was a huge success. And we also did a book, the, the, the book that I mentioned, yes. Days of Hope and Dreams. Yes. We came back and did a Patty Smith show and a Patty, my Patty Smith book. American uh, Artist. Smith. American artist. Yeah. So we we were rocking and rolling there for a while, and um, and then all of a sudden I started. He he wanted to do a deal with me and take ten percent of a commission to a, a gallery in New York. So we went up there. No, he didn't go up. I I know what happened. I right. I was up there for a show. Yeah, I did a show that Chris kind of worked with the guy at another gallery um, in Midtown Manhattan. Right. And, um, so mm -hmm. the next day after the opening of the show, I went down to Soho and there was this little storefront gallery called Morrison Hotel Gallery. Oh. And I walked in and saw this fellow, Peter Blatchley, who had, they had Henry Diltz's stuff on the wall. Wow. Had, um, oh my God, Jim Marshall. Jim Marshall's stuff. Yeah. And a few others, but that was it. And I said to, I didn't know the fellow, you know, and I said, listen, uh, my name is Frank Stefanko. Uh, would, would you maybe at some point have maybe 10 feet of wall space so I could put some photos up in your gallery? He says, Frank, I know who you are. <laughs> you get 20 feet. <laughs> we'll show here. And then we're going to go to our gallery out in, um, in California. And we're going to do another show there. And, uh, and we're going to, we're going to do it up right. And, Oh. The beginning of now I'm in galleries. I have Morrison still represents me in New York and in LA and in Maui. And uh, I have a gallery in Sydney, Australia that represents me and a gallery with several others in LA that do a little bit with me. But, um, and then I have snap galleries that rep exclusive representer to Eric Miola in the UK oh. represents me. And um, so deserved. Yeah. And then and then and then in Sweden, uh, the photo gallery, um, Netta, uh, right. uh, Johansson represents me there. And, and then the good thing was that uh, I got a call who was a Facebook friend of mine from a guy named Guido Harari. Guido is probably one of the premier legendary photographers in Europe and Italy. Oh. And um He's, this was years after Days of Hope and Dreams, and I had taken more photographs, and I had photographed him in concert, and 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 he said, I think you got another book, and I said, you know what, you must be psychic. I said, you you know, uh, you're a kindred spirit because I was feeling. He got in a plane and came over from Italy. We sat down and went through everything, and I oh. mean, that was a whole other story. Oh, I uh, love that. That was wonderful. Yeah. I totally love that. Was was that further up the road? Was that pictures from the the, the river tour stuff, or was that before that? The in Phil, the Philly tour in 2016. I did a Bruce at the time, from the beginning in 1978 to present, and then I asked Bruce at his show. I think it was 2000, 2016. Yes, the river tour, the return yeah. river tour, right? Check in Philly, and we were, he was looking through my cameras and everything, and. He, so I said, look, I need, I want, can you, I want to come up to Colts Neck and just take some post pictures of you to finish the book, to have some 2017 books to make it almost 40 years of my work with you. And he didn't have time for this. He didn't have, finally, one day I just called him up. I said, I'm, I'm coming to deadline. <laughs> he said, can you come up Monday? I said, I'm there. <laughs> so we did a whole shooting session and in retrospect, when I looked at that book and saw the stuff from 1978 and all through the, the decades, and then finally saw the work that we did up at Colts Neck, and I saw how my work had had evolved and had improved and had, you know, I was so in love with those photographs. And, um, you know, so I also, I photographed them in concert 2012 in Philly and in Sweden. Danny, Danny Clinch and I were on the stage at, at, at the, the stadium. And then I photographed him in 2016 in Philly and oh. it's Zero Stadium in Milan, Italy. So, oh, and all that's in the book. What do you take away from this guy 
everybody's got their feelings, their love, their ups, the downs, the ticket thing did hit people a little hard. And that was a little overwhelming to have to hear about every single day for three well, months. Yeah, that was, you know, the point about that was that he wasn't the only one. Ticketron raised the prices for all the people that they were. Ticketmaster, you know, yeah. yeah. Putting on. And everything else had gone up in price pretty good, too. Yeah. But, you know, it was expensive and uh, it did hit a lot of people the wrong way. Mm -hmm. But I read on Facebook and different other, you know, people, unfortunately, there's some people that think they're Bruce Springsteen fans that say, well, you know, he didn't look too good that night or uh, I know. You know this or that negative stuff. And, uh, oh, those ticket prices or whatever. And and my dear, dear friend, Chris Phillips, you know, yes. God bless him. He had to, he had to shut down uh, back streets uh, right. because of that and other things. So, yeah, I was going to ask you about that, Frank, because that's a big deal for Springsteen fans, and everybody's like, "Whoa!" I mean, it was it was it was the Bible. It was you wanted to know something, you go to Backstreets, you know. Totally, yeah. I got one of my I got a little review I did for a Seeger Sessions gig that printed in there when I was just starting to be a music writer way back when, and I was like, "Wow, that was a Bible for us us fans." Chris was, was Chris was you know all through the years he had supported me and you know with book sales and you know and. Uh, things about my my shows uh which was wonderful but um i wrote something that he published back in 2012 i think it was yeah 2012 at the uh, ulevi stadium in gothenburg sweden right danny and i were on stage uh you know kind of on, on the backstage on the side and before the show when we were backstage uh, there was a lot of clutter, uh, clatter, and you know Bruce wants to see Jake. Where's Jake? Find Jake. Bruce needs to talk to Jake. You know, and I'm thinking, what the hell's going on? And we didn't, you know, we kind of went on to the next thing. The next thing, didn't think about it too much until he went up on stage that night, and for the first time since Clarence Clemens had passed away, he did Jungle Land, and Jake did. You know, he called on Jake to dig down deep and find that sax solo and right. and uh, and he he did it and everybody was crying backstage and and Stephen uh, Van Sant I saw he had turned around turned his back to the audience and bowed his head for a little bit before yes. you know when they were getting it was such a magic moment so I wrote a piece about that and uh, Chris published it mm -hmm. and so to to accompany the photographs uh, from Ulevi Stadium in my book, uh, Bruce Springsteen, Further Up the Road, um, I reprinted that story that I put in there about, you know, Jungle Land and, wow. uh, oh, and boy. how I lived on a magic, magic night. In the yeah, it was. I'm interviewed Nils uh, Lofgren and, and we talked about his deep affection and, and love for Clarence. And I remember him standing off stage and watching Jake, who I've interviewed as well. Uh, start to play that solo, which is still the greatest moment live for me is seeing him through third row at the river shore, the original river tour. Uh, and what, what, what is it about Springsteen that just thinks that separates him from others? He's not pretentious. I mean, he had a hard road to hoe to get to where he was. Um, I mean, he had some very <clears throat> fortunate um, things to work in his favor, like the meeting with John Hammond. Totally. Your records. And, you know, uh, if, you know, John didn't like him, who knows what might have happened. Yeah. You know? uh, but he works hard. Uh, he knows his craft. He knows <laughs> the music. He has an affection for the music. He is just, you know, like I said, a tremendous work ethic. But he has this charisma where he can take the E Street Band. He made a statement once about the E Street Band. He said, I think he said it in the Born to Run book. He said, I didn't want the best musicians. I wanted the right musicians. Yes. And I mean, he could, if you ever saw that piece where um, Bruce was, uh, somebody wanted to hear um, the Chuck Berry song, um, uh, that they did in Pulp Fiction. Uh, I can't remember the name. Oh, yeah. Time. But uh, 
he performed that overseas at one of the stadiums and the band didn't know how to do it. They hadn't done it and he hadn't done it in a, you know, so he started, you know, bip, bip, bip and do this. And he went over to, you know, bop, 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 and, he, and the horn section, you come in dan, 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 and little by little, you saw him actually cook this song <laughs> until it became done and right. And they, they, they kicked ass with it. I mean, oh. that kind of magic, you don't see that kind of magic from other people, you know, no, no. just put it together, you know, no. uh, there's so much magic about him. And, uh, but yet, you know, with all his success and all his wealth and, and everything, uh, you know, you got to keep a certain distance, but most, you know, he's still a regular guy in essence. Yeah. Even though he's, oh, the other thing is when I first met him, you know, he talked like, uh, you know, a kid from North Jersey, New York. Yeah, we'll, we'll get one of these and we'll go over there and we'll do that, you know. And, uh, but over the years, I remember up, up at his place one time, he asked me if I had read a couple of books. You know, one was one was about Iwo Jima and things like that, you know, and he was so well read. He self-educated himself right. along with the guidance of uh, Mr. John Landau uh you know to giving him advice and stuff right. he has he has self-educated himself to be more worldly more knowledgeable more astute than people that have graduated from college which right is not, you know. oh just and you, you know you were able to spend some time that is not a uh that is a rare thing with him i think from he's he's had he has friends in his in his world but to be able to do those things and go up and hang out and just be one-on-one -on -one is a rarity and that had to be a wonderful experience. Well, I think the, the trust had a lot to do with it. I think he knew that, you know, because of our original conversation very at the very beginning at my house in 1978 in Haddonfield, New Jersey, that that uh, that I was from the same ilk in terms of, uh, you you know, you can trust Frank. He's all right, you know. Yeah, and I didn't have, Stephen wouldn't ask me to come and do the... <laughs> side album you know yeah no that's absolutely wonderful i know we're both going to be ecstatic to get back out and see him in the next uh, few months um putting a kind of a circle on this because i wanted to hit this hit the nutshell on this year besides this wonderful experience with bruce and patty and rock and roll and things like that landscape and nature photography seems like it's a an absolute love of yours um it it took you to places that i love you said these places i may never have explored without my love of photography and my ability to get there why was it a uh, why was it another part of your photography love is is these landscape nature pieces i think and and maybe some of it was after my first wife passed away but i found a certain peace uh, being out in the wilderness areas. And I mean, places where you don't see footprints of man that often. Um, I have photographed, the, like I said earlier, the Florida Everglades and, and uh, Southwest Florida, which is still, there's still some beautiful places, the animals and the, the landscape. Um, the desert Southwest, that, that photograph of Monument Valley in back of you there. Um, Americans should go out there and see what America is, you know, um, Arizona, Utah, Colorado, beautiful, beautiful places, California. And I don't mean the, the, the coastal, but inland um, a ways. Uh, then, of course, Australia, Hawaii. Um, oh, I when I was a kid, I, Carol, my my current, you know, my wife and I, we loved the television show called uh, Adventures in Paradise. Oh. Uh, Gardner McKay on the Tiki sailing through French Polynesia. So we had an opportunity uh, on this sailing ship, the Star Clippers that uh, was sailing to French Polynesia and we jumped on it, even though it was pricey, we jumped on it and we went to uh, Tahiti, and Bora Bora, oh. and Moria, and Huahini, and the Atoll of Fakarava, and I was able to take all these beautiful photographs in French Polynesia that I never would have had the chance. And New Zealand and my wife's sister lives in Australia. Beautiful photographs in Australia. Um, it's it makes me smile. It makes me swell up to take in the vast, you know, these vast scenic areas and, and you know, God's earth, if you will. You know, not that I'm overly religious, but 
when you get out there, you get a little pang of religion there and say, somebody made all this, you know? <laughs> yes, absolutely. Somebody had to put all this together. And yeah. when, when you go out these days and you pick up the camera and go, it, it still enriches your soul? Absolutely. Especially when I'm out, you know, when I'm out there. And like I said, even going to the Jersey Pine Lands and, you know, tramping through the, you know, to the pine forest. And, just, you know, if you open up and there's a little, there's a little lagoon there with, you know, a couple of uh, ducks or something. Then you take that knowledge that it got way back when of art and composition and, and make sure that, so, you know, I mean, I said this before, you can take a, a flower and put it in a vase and stick it on a table and have three or four or five people come in with the same camera and the same, I used to say the same film, but with the same digital cards and the same everything. Right. And you will get six or seven different photographs because nobody sees things the same way. Right. And I was fortunate enough to have people train me on what art looks like and what, what makes good art. And I was able to encompass, I couldn't draw like my friends in high school, like Ken and, 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 and other artist friends I know. Uh, but, um, but I could do photography and I would, and I took that, education of art and just utilized it in my photography to uh, and you know i like my photographs yeah you think and that's yeah. why frank stefanko i put monument valley behind me because not only is this a beautiful and people will see shots throughout the show of, of these kind of views um but you've also had a monumental part of the photography world and you you should be very very proud of what you've been doing uh Thank you. I am. <laughs> yes, I I would yeah. be, and and it's what I fulfilling, very fulfilling. Yeah. I bet. And what I'll be waiting for um, is both some pictures from uh, hopefully Philly, if that all works out for you, to see what you've been able to do with Bruce on this tour. Because again, this is a very interesting time for him. Six, seven years since he's toured. He's a little older. He still sounds wonderful. I love the hair is all cut and you know up here and sitting there, but he seems back, doesn't he? Well, the first Tampa and um, and then Atlanta, Atlanta, and then right? Orlando and then Hollywood. Those were you could see from a very. I want. I don't want to. You know, everybody loved the, the concerts, and there's no question about that. But you could see that he was still putting it together. Yes, and like he, he did every like he did every tour almost. Sure, you know that's why <clears throat> if I get to see him in Philly. I'll know that I'll, you know, he'll have it down by then. Right. <laughs> yeah, that's why March 27th in D.C. is mine. And uh, I'm ecstatic. And he'll be, yeah, he'll be in. There was one clip where they had Born to Run into, into Rosalita. And boy, did the band sounded good. He couldn't stop smiling, which I really loved. Because he seemed like, I'm happy to be out here. God, I'm, ha I'm so happy. And so, look, I'll be looking for that. Let, hopefully, we'll keep in touch on you doing that. Also, anything else? that you're doing i'm gonna i'm gonna want to find out so let's keep in close touch but frank stefanko you made my month by taking this time with me thanks for doing living on music with me my pleasure steve thank you so much for inviting me oh a picture up in back of you too yeah. i know and i i, I just can't not want to run behind me after i'm done and run run right behind the the big uh you know that but uh but I, I love every minute of this. Um, I will keep in touch with you. Congratulations on an amazing life run of photography and more to come, I'm sure. Let's keep in touch. Thank you, Steve. All right, Rob. Thanks, Frank. Bye-bye. Well, whenever I look at darkness anymore, which I look at it every other day still because I'm such a fan, or the river or anything to do with Springsteen that Frank has had to do with, um and also his amazing career what a great walk frank stefanko thank you my man for honoring me with the privilege to talk to you about all of that wonderful stuff and um, what i would love to do is obviously keep in close touch thanks frank um for everybody real quick if you want to be part of the living on music nation and you aren't yet go to facebook it's uh, facebook.com um, slash groups slash living on music right here and you just join and you'll get pinged we don't do a billion posts a day so you won't get overindulged but we we really have a wonderful uh close to 1300 member um and growing uh group a family nation on living on music and they put starting to post more 
And, um, you know, we I just contribute things that I find that I, I, I think will be interesting musically to people, uh, clips, photos, um, my shows, um, polls, uh, ar articles, just a lot of different things that have to do with uh, music. And so that's what you would be part of uh, and living on music. Also, YouTube, we are really growing well on the living on music YouTube channel. I really only started it the middle of uh, 2022 a little before that and um, we're soaring pretty well in fact one episode i have that um, it's an excerpt a small part of an episode with carmine apis epis the incredible legendary drummer for vanilla fudge ted nugent rod stewart played with jeff beck I, I did a clip him talking about jeff beck and rod stewart and it's got over thirteen thousand views and people um can jump on stuff when they can find it. So that's why I love some of these amazing artists to share it around their own base. And that's where people will love it. But go to YouTube and find not only full episodes, but also the uh, Living on Music excerpts. And you'll find some wonderful moments with some of my most amazing guests. Also, Living on Music is a podcast, the audio only of the, uh, of the show. And it is on all the podcasts that you probably know. Um, and you just go to your own podcast, put in Living on Music with Steve Hauck. And you'll see about 20, 25 of the most recent episodes. And there's some amazing stuff. There's some great excerpts on, on podcasting uh, with Rick Wakeman, with David Crosby. Um, I also have um, uh, one I did, a podcast about the Bruce Springsteen show that he did after 9-11. And uh, it was one of the most incredible shows of the dozens I've seen of his. And I talked about it. And I think you'd love to hear that if, if you're a fan or even if you're just a music fan. Anyway, you can go to the podcasts and become a member and and comment. And and um, if you would, uh, even short two sentence comment, it really helps kind of surge the um, <clears throat> the podcast a along a little bit. Stay safe. Things are still bouncing around. Had some friends last week who came down with that silly darn thing that's been beating us up for three years. But it is waning a bit. It is giving us a chance to get out there. Live music is out there. I'm recording this with Frank um, when I recorded it. And the next day, uh, I had my second wind show after three years and uh, one of the most memorable experiences of my entire life. So music is getting back. And if you're down or even if you're up and you want something to kind of keep you going, keep your heart full, your soul full, just remember, keep living on music.